Howdy folks, I'm Rand Fishkin, co-founder and CEO of SparkToro. Very excited to be here with you today. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk through these sort of secret forces behind the web and we've got a ton of, to get through. So let's get started. I am of the opinion that the golden age of digital marketing has ended. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So from 2001 to about 2015, 2016 maybe, you had these, um, forces at work, right? The, the internet was growing so fast. There were so many people in developed and developing nations that were getting online and adopting services that even big tech companies, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc., didn't really need to deviate from their core value propositions in order to get the growth that their private investors, right, their venture investors, and then Wall Street demanded. Uh, data about what was sending you traffic, keywords that were sending you traffic, uh, websites that were sending you traffic, referral data, uh, cookie tracking, right? All of these things made organic marketing efforts relatively easy to justify and invest in ad targeting too, right? A lot of this tracking and privacy concerns uh, that we're encountering today didn't really exist during this time. And in most sectors, you only had a few players who were willing to invest, especially in things like SEO and content and social and digital PR and email marketing effectively. And so even little guys, right, any of us could compete. But in the last five, six years, a lot of this has changed, right? Google nixed keyword data. Uh, big tech obfuscated a ton of traffic from all sorts of sources, including a lot of apps and social uh, platforms, which meant more dark traffic. And Google starts competing with all, all of us, right? In every industry after industry, jobs, hotels, flights, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, everyone, even the laggards, are finally investing in digital marketing. And look, the pandemic absolutely accelerated this. Doesn't matter how you know, esoteric or small your business was in 2020, you had to get online. All the social algorithms, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, LinkedIn, uh, all of them started biasing to content that would keep users on their platforms and in their walled gardens. No surprise. And through monopoly power, all these government lobbying efforts and, and thousands of acquisitions meant that a few tech giants control the overwhelming majority of the web. Now, look, I um, I hate bullet points, so I'm going to try to not have any more slides like this one. Or you just stick with me. What's next? How can we best respond? Well, I think keeping up with the news that impacts the digital landscape is kind of exhausting, right? If you try and just I don't know, pay attention to all of the different news out there. Yeah, Google is taking more and more share of searches. And yes, they are removing paid search data. And I, I got to go check out the SEER post from September showing uh, what's what's happening. And, you know, 28% of our paid search data is gone. Google is putting these, these different uh, results up on top of uh, ads in both in the case of branded search and unbranded search. And part of that is look so that they can uh, get a lot of us bidding on navigational search, which has been happening for a long time. And, and part of it is getting this huge revenue boost from just owning the way users navigate the internet, which, which Google absolutely does through Android and Chrome and, and search. Google is now planning to kill third-party cookies, right? Which started with pressure from Apple and Mozilla Firefox. And they're doing this in such a way that will appear, at least from a press perspective, will appear consumer friendly and privacy friendly. But let, let's be real, right? It's so that they can become the only data provider at scale through this like federated lists of cohorts or, or whatever technology they end up going with. Uh, so that only they can effectively serve the display retargeting remarketing market. No surprise there again. Facebook doing similar things, right? Linking up WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram, not because this is super convenient for users. In fact, I don't know if you've tried the Instagram connection to Facebook Messenger, but this is because it will make it tough for regulators who might work with antitrust to uh, break up or easily suggest a breakup solution if they find you know facebook guilty of all these things which they're probably guilty of at least in my opinion and 
uh, you'll recall the Cambridge Analytica scandal of 2016, which of course, you know, <laughs> predicated um, was was predicated on a lot of user data collection and abuse, and then Facebook sort of shifting a whole ton of how its platform worked and what was prioritized in the news feed, what was prioritized in uh, uh, in in everyone's um, apps and and on the on their website and what they were sort of showing you in navigation, and this new system, right, which which prioritized groups is conveniently very hard for researchers or press to track, right? A lot of stuff that goes on in these groups is private. No, no surprise there. And then of course, they're happy to host and, and amplify this problematic content of all kinds um, so that they can earn engagement and add revenue, sure, but also because uh, it is very effective at forming addiction, right? And a lot of people who belong to these types of groups uh, do so because the algorithm recommends it. Google, uh, uh, sorry, Facebook gets a ton of value out of that. Look, at the same time that was happening, what did Facebook have to do? They had to drop organic reach right across uh, the news feed and through all the pages that, that we had built as marketers and content creators and promoters because there just wasn't enough eyeballs out there, right? And so, you know, we were complaining years ago that uh, oh, Facebook um, average engagement rates are like 1%, 2%. Now it's 0.09% uh, across all industries, which is just, just miserable, right? And this, this forces a lot of us to pay when we want amplification, but it also keeps people on Facebook in Facebook's walled garden and prevents any upstarts like what you saw at the start of the decade, right, with players like uh, Farmville and um, later BuzzFeed, right, building their businesses off the back of Facebook engagement. Amazon's no different. Well, they are different in their structure and in how they do it, but no different in sort of the abuse of monopoly power to do this, right? Amazon keeps taking larger cuts of seller revenue to discourage anyone else from building, you know, profitably on their on their platform and to leverage the market dominance that they build to increase their own profits. You might've noticed that, you know, whatever it was, 10 years ago, Amazon was one of the cheapest places to buy online. It was unbelievably cheap. And today it is shockingly for many, many products where Amazon is sort of owns the market, it's not the cheapest. In fact, sometimes it's very expensive. Weird. Well, not weird. Mm. Amazon learns what sells, and then it cuts out creators by making its own products. And you know, Congress obviously accused Amazon of doing this. They denied it, and then there was this great Wall Street Journal report showing, oh no, that's that's exactly what they do, right? If you are trying to play whack-a-mole, following all of these news things, you you, you could have a full-time job just trying to pay attention to all of the things that the major tech platforms, which control so much of what we all do online and what everybody does online, that a marketer really cannot stay a step ahead. I think, you know, those of us like myself who, who try to be whatever industry analysts and prognosticators and, and write content about what's going on and present about it, even for us, it's a struggle. <laughs> it's our freaking job, right? Well, part of our job anyway. Instead, I think we need to take a systems thinking approach, right? Systems thinking is, is that by understanding root causes of an environment, we can optimize tactics and strategies for the long term, right? So I, I found it really helpful um, to think of this visually. And there's, there's a few visual uh, ideas out there about systems thinking. For example, you have kind of disconnection, right? All the, these separate points, like Facebook does this, Google does that, uh, Twitter does this. But you can connect these up because they are related. You can you can have individual analysis of like here's Amazon's move, here's Google's move, or you can have synthesis in terms of here are the root causes for why all of these things are being changed. And now I'm going to attempt a synthesis of my own, which is <laughs> to try and condense 70 years of economic history leading to this point and the root causes that are the driving force behind so much of this in just five short minutes. All right, you, you can time me, you ready? Here we go. Essentially, I'm gonna tell you a story about how capitalists, right, investors, uh, private and public, came to prefer growth over profit and how that changed the landscape, especially in the technology world and what it means going 
So let's go back to 1950. Uh, there's this great New York Times piece that you can where you can interactively play with the uh, tax rates based on the year, right? And taxation in 1950 was surprisingly progressive in the United States, at least. The more you made, the more you paid. Wealthy families and corporations, though, used their dollars and their influence, right, to bring taxes down. And as their profits soared, uh, the richest Americans also managed to get the fastest income growth. And you, most of you who followed income inequality or seen any of these graphs, right? This, is, this has been very memefied across the web and across po political culture. Simultaneous to that, there's this huge gap between productivity and pay that sort of emerges starting right around 1980, right? So people are working harder, they are producing more, L labor is sort of um, contributing more, everyone's doing more at their job, and that productivity gain is being distributed almost exclusively to the owners of capital. And a big part of this is through the tax code, right? This gap between rich and poor then is a powerful catalyst for greater political strife. And when you have high inequality and high political tension and strife uh, and a lot of division, you can stoke those fires to, well, get people to take their eye off the ball in terms of inequality, which has certainly happened in the US. Over the last 40 years, uh, this effort has been ludicrously successful. So you can see it paying enormous dividends where the richest 400 Americans are paying much less than anyone who works, you know, the register at Taco Bell, which seems very odd, very, very odd. If it feels strange to you, uh, you, you are not alone. There's a lot of people uh, who worry about this, but it also has a big impact on digital because the biggest way this happens is through capital gains versus ordinary income, right? So, you know, I have my salary, I make money on that, I pay my, I don't know what my tax rate is, 35%, maybe something like that, 30%. Um, and if I realize those gains through capital gains, I am instead paying much lower rates. I'll show you how crazy it is. This chart is kind of a nightmare, but the big green area is what you wanna focus on. Essentially, as the tax codes switch to favor capital gains rates, Americans, well, rich Americans, shifted how they made their money. Yeah, tax code incentives, they really work. In tech, ex investors, um, the people who put money into Google, Amazon, Facebook, Reddit, LinkedIn, uh, Microsoft, right? Early companies and later ones exploit this loophole, the, the capital gains loophole, and it's a loophole that's only grown. If I invest, let's say uh, five years ago, I don't know, I somehow had $50,000 and I invested in a company that made me $10 million in uh, profit when it sold, I would pay zero tax dollars on that. Absolutely none, not, not a single penny because of how capital gains works. The, the, the tax rate since 2010 uh, for capital gains on investments of less than $10 million, whatever, is, is, is $0. So pretty crazy, pretty crazy. Fun story. So investors the, in the venture ecosystem, which is basically almost all of the public tech companies that control our lives and world, um, would not beat alternative investment options if it weren't for this capital gains loophole. Like that, that extra 15 to 30% savings that they get, sometimes I guess as much as 38%, right? Uh, that would eliminate the value of investing in venture instead of, I don't know, public markets or real estate or small businesses or whatever you want. And not that many venture capital firms even hit the targets. But this is important because investors do not, public investors, right, who put money into Google or Facebook and private investors who put money into the next Google and Facebook, they don't prioritize you know, getting small exits or having small profitable companies that keep paying dividends over time. These investors prioritize a portfolio that has one or two winners and 98 losers, right? Essentially companies that don't really make them any money or, or go bankrupt trying to become unicorns. It is really a model where unicorns are more valued than anything else because growth is how investors want their money to come back to them because of capital gains. They don't want profits. They don't want 
uh, uh, revenue that comes back to hitting them in ordinary income, they want to be paid through, you know, essentially holding a stock for five years and then selling it or holding private company ownership and then selling it. It is this model that's so important to understand because that is the root cause of so much of how tech works. This affects both the web landscape and the digital marketing world and, and explains a lot of this disconnection to connectedness. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to try and uh, synthesize this real quick. Basically, you know, you have these investor backed companies spending a lot of money for unprofitable growth, which drives up ad prices. You have investors who are willing to suffer 99 bad investments to find one potential monopoly. So you get paid acquisition as the primary channel, right? Because it's provable, you can show investors like, hey, if we spend 50 bucks, we get a new customer, 500 bucks, 5,000 bucks. Big tech realizes this, of course, and they also value growth themselves. So they can start pulling data away from trackable efforts. This helps company leadership or forces company leadership to value growth over everything else. They, they already do because that's the only way to become a unicorn. That's the only way to give their investors the kind of growth they want. And then, you know, this, this big tech tracking problem doubles down on this. So these, these forces feel disconnected, but in fact, they are all connected by really just two things, algorithms and incentives. The incentives drive the behavior the algorithms govern all of our behavior and the ecosystems that we live in. So in order to keep up with these changes, maybe we don't have to analyze each bit individually, right? Maybe we can synthesize them, go from being reactive to proactive and accurately predict where these big tech changes are taking place and how. That's what I wanna spend the next few minutes talking about how these algorithms and incentives power everything we do online. So big tech owns, dominates the market, right? The top 1% uh, of websites, or similar web, right? The top of the top like 10,000-ish, 8,000-ish websites, 1% get 98% of the traffic. The engagement algorithms across all of these are similar. So here's my Twitter feed, uh, recent Twitter feed. There's Andrew and then Ross and Michelle. This is what Twitter thinks is most likely to keep me engaged on their site. That's second most, and that's third most, right? It's not about how many times was it retweeted or liked or any of those things. It is a machine learning based algorithm. Behind the scenes, right, what, what's, those machines are doing this. They're essentially looking at, here's some signals, and they're not deciding, you know, it's not a bunch of people, engineers or product people in a room deciding, oh, signal A and B and C, yeah, let's wait it this way. It's a machine that's been giving, given an ideal outcome, right? And the ideal outcome it optimizes toward, it, it determines the ranking score based on the weighting of the input. So like, oh, signal A looks really good. Let's bump that up because that's returning a better outcome. In the past, as digital marketers, it was great knowing the inputs that write the signals. Today, not so much, right? What we really need to know is the ideal outcome, what it's optimizing toward, because those signals don't just change every day, they change for every single person. They change for everyone using the system because they're personalized. What are the machine learning systems incentives, right? What is it trying to accomplish? Number one, it wants to show the content that is most likely to keep us engaged on these pages. Number two, it's trying to prioritize posts that will keep the user on the site, not clicking to other websites. This is why uh, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Reddit, on so many places, you see posts that are not including a link to the other source, right? Here's French Stewart, I think as an actor, and you know he's saying like, oh, here's this Fox News talking point Here's a picture of it, no link to Fox News. That's gonna do better, generally speaking, than one that includes a link. And number three, they wanna gather as much user data about all of us as possible so that they can improve their targeting and their engagement in the future. Reddit works the same way. So does Instagram. So does Facebook. 
So does YouTube. So does LinkedIn. Even Google News and Google Discover, if you're on an Android device and using that, work the same way, right? They try and predict what's going to engage you and keep you coming back to them. Google Search is actually not that different. It uses an algorithm with a similar incentive structure. I do a search for rice donabe, because of course I've been doing lots of cooking in uh, quarantine, and there's just one cookbook. This is the result that Google, generally speaking, has found satisfies the most searchers who have my you know, behavioral pattern and search query. And this is the second most likely, and this is the third most likely. Feel familiar? It's really similar to how all the social algorithms work. We don't need to know all of the inputs. Like, okay, it's great to know that keywords and content and links and all those kinds of things, you know, anchor text, whatever it is, fine, wonderful. But you know what? That is not nearly as helpful as understanding what drives searchers to be satisfied by one result versus another. Because over time, that's what Google will optimize for, right? It's things like uh, the brand and the relevance and the trustworthiness and the accuracy and the visual appeal and the quality of the results and the comprehensiveness, social proof. All those things are driving the result because Google's incentive is to get you addicted to search and happy with your search results so you come back and search them more and more. So what do we want to do? Well, on Google, on Google search, right, we probably want to optimize for results that best satisfy searchers versus individual ranking factors. It's not that they're not important. They still get used. There are some that are well known. But I want, I want the result that satisfies the searchers. That will get me rising to the top. On all these social networks, I want engaging posts, earning amplification, and keeping users on the network. Right? That, that is going to be the thing that gets my content in front of more people. And on these content networks like YouTube and Google Discover and Google News, right? it's content that keeps people coming back. Content that engages them, keeps them there, gets them returning. Strategy, tactics. This pattern actually works for advertising algorithms too, right? Here's a, you know, my Instagram ads, my, my uh, uh, Google display network ads. This is retargeting obviously, but you know, I'm shop, shopping for sneakers. No one can see my shoes. Well, I'm actually not even wearing shoes for this talk. Shh. Uh, but, right? Um, <laughs> But, but Google is not showing me the highest bidder for the ad. They, they never have, right? They're showing what they think is most likely to succeed and resonate with me as a you know, viewing person on the internet. Instagram's the same way, right? It's, it's looking for a combination of revenue, continued use, personalized behavior. Searcher satisfaction tends to beat ad revenue. When you see an ad in the search results, we, we, we know this in digital marketing, right? That, this is not the highest paying advertiser. In fact, they are probably one of the lowest paying advertisers per click on the page because their ad score, their ad quality score is high. Meanwhile, the advertisers that are lower down pay more and get less traffic. So if you do tighter targeting with greater relevance, you get better ad quality scores, which means, right, you get shown to more people more of the time for a lower cost. This, this works really well. And it's, it's in both, the, both parties' incentive to have it work this way. So how does this apply to marketing strategy? Right? I, I mean, I think, first off, just knowing these two things, we can predict so much of the future. We can understand so many of the individual points that we're supposed to analyze in the news every day about what's going on in digital marketing. But I think there's a few big picture lessons for strategy that are worth taking away. If you wanna make your marketing competitive, to me, it's kind of these three big ones. Number one, you want to build a brand people know, like, trust, and prefer to all the potential alternatives out there, whether that's, you know, no matter where you are showing up. So, um, <laughs> example here. I mentioned I've been doing a lot of cooking. It is not just Japanese cooking. I have been um, obviously, you know, using my new rice donabe, which I paid like almost $200 for. Geraldine was not thrilled when she found out. Um, but, 
but I, I've also been cooking a lot of pasta and uh, especially over the summer and fall, a lot of pesto. So I'm like looking up how to make the best pesto, best pesto. And I see this, that giant mortar and pestle, right? I'm like, huh, well, that's interesting. That's my first time seeing it. Second time I'm, uh, you know, over on this, this blog and I'm reading about Nuova Marmotecnica. Okay. Hmm. Nuova Marmotecnica. I guess, oh, maybe that's, maybe that's that same mortar and pestle. Then I go to a small kitchen in Genoa. Oh, there it is again. Brand impression number 16. Man, that just keeps showing up. So eventually what happens? Yep. You got it. I gave up. I spent another $220 buying this pesto rock and stick. And oh my God, friends, it makes great pesto. I'll show you. It, <laughs> it's really sweaty work um, and you get very hot doing it, but the pesto is amazing. Well, what happened there, right? The, I saw Nuovo Marma Tecnica again and again and again. I saw it in all this, these sources of influence that were affecting me. And eventually I caved and bought it, right? I had the interest. I was a potential customer. By being in all those right places, that was the brand that I went for. This is kind of a timeless strategy, right? You figure out who your right customers are. You find the messages that resonate with them. You uncover the sources that they pay attention to and find where they're engaging, right? In my case, it was mostly uh, Instagram and Twitter and then shifting over to a lot of web and recipe, uh, recipe websites. And then you go amplify your message in the places that your target customers pay attention, which look, that's kind of what Spark Toro does. So, you know, um, Please forgive my uh, brief mention of, of my own company, right? But essentially the idea here is I have this audience, people who talk about Italian food, use the hashtag Italian food on social networks, mostly Instagram and Twitter in this case. And then these sources of influence, right? Uh, Italy Magazine was one of the places that influenced me to purchase my Nuova Marmo Tecnica $220 pestle rocket stick. Number two. I cannot urge you enough to invest in a diverse set of marketing channels so you're not just reliant on one. You know, it, if you're doing paid acquisition through ads, each incremental ad impression and customer costs dollars and, and efforts to improve those are often offset by competition or rising prices. And look, when Facebook and Google need to show Wall Street more growth, we suffer, right? This is the incentive. This is why Google pulled those 28% of paid search clicks, uh, click data back in September, like the Sierra Interactive blog was showing. It's just boulder pushing you're doing, right? Every step of progress requires the same amount of effort. You're not gaining efficiency. It's, it, it's really tough to build competitive advantage here. Smart brands diversify their marketing channels. And in fact, during the pandemic, we saw a lot more diversification. Uh, this is the Gartner study that was uh, recently done last year, survey of a bunch of CMOs. And you can see like much more diversity. I think historically it was almost 50% advertising. Now, if you add up um, paid search, um, offline advertising and digital, you're, you're only getting about 35, 40%. So fallen dramatically, other channels are on the rise like social search, content, website, etc. So just don't build your digital home on rented land. You're using all these diverse channels, but don't make them your center point. Don't make your YouTube channel the center point. I use and love you know, using YouTube and Reddit and Instagram and Google News and Discover and LinkedIn and Search, all these places, but they all have to point back to my website and email list because we know that the engagement rates on these places, the reach on these places is dropping over time. These are the only channels you can own and control. Um, and by the way, I thought it was fascinating that I went to MailChimp and, and looked up their uh, average uh, email open and click-through rates compared to Facebook's average reach and engagement rates. It's a 252X difference. So uh, that speaks for itself. Not to mention emails convert, they just do. Very, very effective, by the way, in, in 2020, going into 2021. A lot of email success. All right, last but not least, if you want to have success long term with the algorithms and the incentives that are driving the web, uh, you need to build a marketing flywheel that scales with de decreasing friction. So for SparkToro, one of the biggest things that I do is 
digital PR. And I do that through a ton of podcasts and webinars and guest appearances on other people's channels. I'll show you kind of how it works. So flywheels create this competitive advantage because they're tough to get going, but they scale with decreasing friction when you do. So I do a marketing thing, like I publish a blog post or, or I appear on somebody's uh, podcast, right? Or on their uh, YouTube channel. And then I boost that thing's reach and they boost that thing's reach uh, through their right, marketing channels. And then that engages and grows the audience. You know, a few people who listen to the podcast are like, oh, that rant guy was interesting. I'm going to go subscribe to SparkToro's blog or see, you know, sign up for a free account or whatever. And then that improves my algorithmic signals next time, right? More people opening my emails, clicking through, uh, following me on social, uh, subscribing to my stuff, right? And, and now I get better ROI when I do it next time. And look, this takes years to build up. You know, in my previous company, Moz, it, it took like six or seven years before this was really humming. With SparkToro, I'm, you know, two and a half years in uh, and it's going well, but I'm definitely nowhere near where I was, you know, a few years ago when, when I was at the height of, of Moz's uh, marketing flywheel. But building this up is truly worthwhile. Alrighty, friends, I feel like we have got a ton of tools now to be able to analyze any big change that's coming to be able to apply it to your strategy and tactics and to think long-term. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, great to have you all here. Uh, you can find the slides and links. Th those will be available soon um, uh, and sent to you. You can also give SparkToro Spin if you'd like uh, for free at sparktoro.com. And uh, if you have any questions or, or want to chat about the presentation, I am rand at sparktoro.com. Thanks so much. Take care.